Ukraine's anti-government forces push further into the country's southeast as the army's losses grow and many soldiers complain of a lack of support from Kiev. As many as 300 Americans are thought to be fighting with the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, this according to the latest figures from Washington. Here on RT International, we take a look at how the group is actually winning the hearts and minds. And Italy wants the veil of secrecy lifted from negotiations over a vast trade deal between the EU and US, are pushing Brussels to make the details of the talks public. Worldwide News 24-7, it's RT International live from Moscow. From me, Rory Suchet and the whole news team here, welcome to the program. Anti-government forces in Ukraine have launched a counter-offensive and are advancing on key areas in the country's southeast. Let's cross live now to our correspondent Paula Slia in eastern Ukraine to get the very latest on this. Paula, good to see you. What do we know about these anti-government forces? A, a new push? It certainly does seem as if it is a new push. What we do know is that these anti-Kiev fighters have now made further advances in Ukraine's southeast. They have taken over the town of Nova Azovsk and they are aiming for the city of Mariupol, which is the second largest city in the region. This comes as the media sensationalizes what's happening on the ground with quite dramatic, over the top, some would say, headlines. Some of the headlines talk about a Russian invasion, about incursions on the Russian border. But the point to make is that none of these stories actually give any kind of hard facts or any kind of evidence to support these claims. It might be fueled by the fact that on Monday, 10 Russian soldiers crossed over into Ukrainian territory. But Moscow has made the, made the point that these soldiers were patrolling the border. This happened at night. This is a border that is very badly signposted. And certainly, these soldiers were, did not put up any kind of resistance when they were detained. There are also allegations that Russian paratroopers have been buried in several Russian cities. Now, again, no proof. What we have heard is from the Russian presidential spokesperson's office saying that they are investigating these claims. All of this comes as the prime minister of the self-proclaimed Republic of Donetsk admits that he never denied that there were Russians fighting among the ranks of the anti-Kiev fighters. But he did say that all of these are volunteers. As the fighting intensifies and anti-government forces close in, a call for help goes unanswered. Reinforcements for trapped Ukrainian troops are slow in coming. It's not the first time Kiev... No. At the same time, we are hearing more and more reports of the Ukrainian military complaining that they have been abandoned by their government. Latest reports suggest that 62 Ukrainian soldiers on Wednesday evening crossed over into Russian territory seeking sanctuary. There is intensive fighting at the moment in the town of Elovysk. This has been a city where the Ukrainian military has been surrounded by anti-government forces. What we're hearing, and this is just one example, is an increasing chorus of criticism by the soldiers themselves and by their families against what they say is a government in Kiev that has betrayed them and not given them much support. As the fighting intensifies and anti-government forces close in, a call for help goes unanswered. Reinforcements for trapped Ukrainian troops are slow in coming. It's not the first time Kiev soldiers feel abandoned. It's a far cry from the tough talk of Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko talking of a strong country and strong army. 
Instead, its young and often inexperienced soldiers, as suggested by an alleged conversation between a commander and a tank soldier leaked online. Frustration is growing among the troops. Their families. And the government. The head of the Interior Ministry is locking horns with the leader of the radical nationalist right sector group, which is taking part in the fighting in the country's east. If our demands are not met, we'll be forced to withdraw our battalions from the front line and launch a march onto Kiev to carry out speedy reforms in the Interior Ministry. Yarosh, with your bragging, you have deceived people whom you led into illegal armed units. You are turning the people who believed you into cannon fodder. Meanwhile, losses on the battlefield are mounting. And here in the center of Donetsk, the Ukrainian military defeat is on show. The message is more than just symbolic. A bad omen for the Ukrainian soldiers encircled by self-defense forces in the region of Donetsk, who are fighting not only for their lives, but for an army that they are accusing of betraying them and leaving them to die. Paul Slia RT, Eastern Ukraine. In the meantime, the army's shelling of cities in East Ukraine continues. 11 civilians were killed in Donetsk on Wednesday. This is according to local authorities. And Russian journalist Andrei Sternin still missing in Ukraine. At the last contact with him over three weeks ago, Russia's foreign ministry is trying to locate the photo correspondent. Kiev still denying it's holding him. Though support for Stenin has come in from all around the world, a global online campaign carrying the free Andrew hashtag. Thanks for joining us for the program today. It's RT International. Washington estimates as many as 300 Americans are now fighting with the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. Now, they could potentially pose a huge risk to U.S. security if they return from war zones and use skills learned abroad to carry out attacks at home. It's been confirmed that a 33-year-old American who had joined the ranks of the jihadists was killed in battle over the weekend in Syria. RT's Gaine Chichikan now reporting on Washington's growing realization. The U.S. president has diagnosed the Islamic State. Rooting out a cancer like ISIL won't be easy and it won't be quick. Many are asking if the cancer could have been caught at an earlier stage when the Islamic State group, as part of the Syrian opposition, was gaining momentum in the country and when rich donors in Gulf states were funding and arming the group. But until recently, the West seemed more preoccupied with toppling the Syrian president. We will work with like-minded states to support the Syrian opposition to hasten the day when Assad falls. The European Union has agreed to bring to an end the arms embargo uh, on the Syrian opposition. We are uh, constantly uh, consulting with the opposition on how they can get organized so that uh, uh, they're not splintered uh, and divided in the face of uh, the onslaught from the Assad regime. For years, the White House tried to present a picture of the Syrian opposition as consisting of, quote, former farmers and teachers. Some within the intelligence community had a really big a red flag go up that was alarming the administration and elected officials that the problem in Syria was bigger than anybody anticipated. But the problem is that the elected officials 
chose to have a moment of dumb and dumber and hear what they wanted to hear. So uh, you had John McCain patrolling the streets of Aleppo thinking that supporting the insurgents was a good idea. One thing the West perhaps failed to see was the blurred lines between the moderate and the radical groups within the Syrian opposition. ISIS until very recently was part of a broad Sunni group in Syria that was being supplied by the United States. The extremist group makes use of modern technologies like no other radical organization. They even use surveillance drones to plan attacks on the Syrian military. The question arises whether the U.S. has misjudged the scale of extremism in Syria as it focused all efforts on bringing down the Syrian government. You ask for so much cooperation, but you know, all, the, all the help you got from America and they're not being with us now, alhamdulillah, for free. They lost in Iraq, they lost in Afghanistan. They're going to lose in Syria also, inshallah, when they come. We'll be waiting for them, inshallah, to take more ghanima from them. The Islamic State group is now cheering about all the arms and money that they have seized, both in Iraq and in Syria. ISIS sympathizers are posting pictures on Twitter in U.S. cities with a message saying, we are in your streets. One thing that is typical of ISIS is this vicious sense of humor, if you will. They're big fans of social media, and they have been using all the West can offer to spread what President Obama called cancer. In Washington, I'm Ganesh Chagyan, RT. And the Islamic State is proving to have one of the most successful business models in the world of terrorism, with assets estimated at $2 billion. Uh, a significant amount, around $2 million a day, though. That's reportedly coming in from selling oil. This being sold to Kurds in Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Jordan, all at very big discounts. There were smuggling and kidnapping, also a very lucrative sideline. Ransom payments have brought in around at least $10 million in recent years. The Islamic State even publishes a corporate-style annual report to attract new sponsors, while its flair for social media publicity is clear. Here's RT's Marina Kosarev. Pictures of mutilated corpses of the so-called infidels and photoshopped images of Western troops engulfed in flames. These are just some of the grotesque methods employed by the Islamic State, illustrated in glossy magazines and online in its attempt to spread its message, a message that even al-Qaeda is uncomfortable with. The visuality, though, is what, what's striking. Uh, Al-Qaeda can produce some remarkably good visual graphics, but nothing on the scale of ISIS. The photography is uh, hyper-real. The Islamic State's marketing techniques are becoming increasingly more professional and widespread, as its propaganda is found in different languages, in news updates, videos, Twitter accounts, magazines and on TV. The demographic they're targeting is youth. They're relying on the ignorance of youth. They're distorting the Quran, of course. Uh, but they're also using various kinds of stylistic mannerisms, which the youth are familiar with from the street, from YouTube, from Twitter and so forth. In other words, it has a very modern look and feel. Uh, it feels like a media extravaganza, but it's suffused with excitement. Now, if we take a look at the cover of the Islamic State's latest magazine, then we will see that it's a play on Noah's Ark in which the message is it's either them or the flood. And experts say they're using controversy and fear to get more followers. How are they doing that? They're using hate propaganda by showing their adversaries paradoxically as kidding babies. They also um, are, I think, remarkably harsh in their language. They present their enemies in dehumanized terms as some kind of uh, subhumanity, just as the Nazis did. So they only use pejoratives like crusaders. While Western nations might be trying to bomb ISIS out of existence, ISIS itself seems to have learned that those bombs can breach social media and therefore its existence online grows stronger than ever. Marina Kostrova reporting from London for RT. Yeah, still to come here on RT International, the uh, social media spiral of silence. Later in the program, we report on a trend of people keeping their opinions far from online. They're keeping them away from the social media platforms and the NSA's cyber spies. Also ahead, check it out. A, a sheriff badge or a Holocaust-era star of David? A Spanish clothing giant Zara coming under attack for a T-shirt with perhaps a touch of Nazi chic.
different leader in Syria now. Uh, many of the members of Congress of both parties who have gone to Syria in recent uh, months have said they believe he's a reformer. I have a very clear message for President Assad, which is it is time for him to go. The only way to bring stability and peace to Syria is going to be for Assad to step down. thing that got America out of the Depression was the Securities Act of 33 and 34. They restored law and order to Wall Street. It wasn't anything to do with repricing gold. It had nothing to do or very little to do with going into World War II. It was bringing about law and order. What's happened in Europe? The disintegration of law and order. The Wild West mentality of letting a bank like Goldman Sachs totally destroy a country like Greece for a few quid. Hello again. Italy has told the EU that it wants the details of negotiations over a giant trade deal between the US and European partners to be made public. In a letter to its uh, European officials, Italy says it would help dispel uh, fears about what's actually going on behind closed doors. Well, let's have a look right now at what the uh, TTIP agreement would mean for both sides. For example, the uh, transatlantic trade deal certainly looks tempting on paper. The partnership would allow the removal of trade barriers and regulatory differences which are seen to hinder the growth of the U.S. and EU economies. Those would be washed away. Plus, America and the EU's collective GDP would be boosted by $245 billion, though there are critics that say some parts of the puzzle just don't entirely fit together. They're worried that corporations could hijack the interests of taxpayers, passing along any losses onto them if anything goes wrong. It's also feared it would be nearly impossible to hold any corporation to account because of the lack of transparency. And investigative journalist John Hillary says it's no accident the talks are being held in secret. We've been told that the details of the EU-US trade deal is completely secret. I mean, they've put a 30-year ban on all the key documents that we would like to see well, the first reason for the secrecy is because the European Commission and the U.S. trade representative, they know that if people really found out about what was going on in these negotiations, they would be up in arms. There is already outrage across the whole of Europe at what we've already learned about the TTIP, the trade negotiation deals. So if people really could see line by line what is being negotiated away behind closed doors, then there'd be revolution in the street. For example, in Germany, there's a very, very high awareness of TTIP, of these new negotiations. And people, by and large, are very, very opposed to it. The latest poll that we have seen suggests that 55% of people in Germany are against TTIP, these new negotiations. And people across Europe have been protesting over the last month about this deal in particular. In Belgium, police dispersed the crowds using water cannons, but not just in Belgium, but also in Berlin. Activists staging a performance by lying on the ground with banners saying, Europe may be for sale, but we are not. And last month saw hundreds marching in London as well. And this against the planned ratification of the pact, saying it'll harm everything from workers' rights to the environment. I'm sure you've uh, noticed how the ice bucket challenge has gone viral with many thousands of people taking part online. But on one Scottish island, it's gone too far. So many people taking part in it over the weekend that local water supplies had to be cut off five times. Details on that at rt.com. Also there, an African-American film producer heading to an Emmy Awards pre-party finds himself handcuffed by the police for six and a half hours. Why was he mistaken for a bank robber? Have a look at RT.com. By nearly 20 minutes past the hour here in Moscow, Spanish clothing giant Zara, it's under fire. Big scandal now over one particular piece of clothing. That one. A striped baby shirt with a sewn-on sheriff badge has led to massive criticism on social media. Shoppers said the item bore a similarity to uniforms worn in Nazi death camps. Uh, the word sheriff is barely visible and the badge looks a lot like the Star of David, a religious symbol the Nazis used to mark out Jews as second-class citizens. 
Now, many Twitter users were appalled, going as far as calling for a ban on the clothing retailer. Azara has since apologized and removed the item from sale, stating that the T-shirt was actually inspired by Western films and wasn't meant to offend anybody. However, though, it's not the first time the clothing giant has been accused of insensitivity on the issue. Back in 2007, Zara had to pull these handbags off the store shelves because of the green swastikas on the far sides as well. All right, let's get to some other global headlines in brief. RT World Update time. Uh, thousands of Shia Muslims taking to the streets of Yemen's capital to call for the downfall of the government. Protesters in support of a key Shia Yemeni leader accused the government of corruption and asked for a decision to cut fuel subsidies to be reversed. Demonstrators said they would continue their protests until the government was gone. The capital has witnessed many protests uh, over the past week. A Pakistani opposition cleric who has been leading mass rallies in Islamabad says negotiations for the current government to be dissolved have failed completely. As a result, during his address to thousands of supporters outside the parliament, he called for a revolution. Demonstrators have been protesting for nearly two weeks, demanding the prime minister leave office over alleged election fraud and calling for reforms to Pakistan's electoral system. The Israeli prime minister declared victory in the recent war against Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Benjamin Netanyahu said the military campaign dealt a heavy blow and a ceasefire deal gave no concessions to Hamas. Palestinian health officials say the seven-week war killed more than 2,200 people and left around 100,000 homeless in the Palestinian enclave. Now, Germany's Minister of Agriculture has come up with his own way to fight Russia's ban on EU food imports. One apple a day keeps Putin away. Well, Schmidt urged Europeans to eat more and consume the extra supplies that would have been sent to the Russian supermarkets. The Belgian farmers uh, clearly don't think that they will work. Uh, their anger showed right there on Wednesday when they dumped actually four tons of vegetables in front of the EU parliament. They say their harvest is going to waste and the EU is not doing enough to compensate. Protesters also handed their excess products out to the public in Brussels. And uh, Anshe Gantner from the International Association for Fru Food Protection uh, believes that people will need to eat a little bit more than just an apple a day. We have to be realistic and straightforward about the fact there's a huge amount of fruit and vegetables and it's difficult to consume this amount. Apples are not the worst case because they can be kept for up to one year, which is not possible with other vegetables. It's impossible to eat 20 kilos of tomatoes a day. So the slogan is clever, but farmers want clear and quick solutions from the EU. Today, the actions of the European Commission are not enough. Producers are expecting more support in response as they send their products to the poor or food banks. Producers expect more compensation for the products that have already spoiled. The money provided today would not compensate the actual losses. A new poll suggests Americans are increasingly unwilling to debate the scope of government surveillance online. The trend now even has its own name, uh, called the spiral of silence. The study also challenges the view of social media as a platform for debate by suggesting sites like Facebook and Twitter actually encourage self-censorship. 86% uh, of Americans apparently will now only discuss last year's revelations by Edward Snowden in private face-to-face -face conversations between friends and family. The survey also suggests only 42% of all Facebook and Twitter users feel comfortable discussing cyber spying online. The report also suggests the uh, self-censorship used on the Internet could be uh, leaking into real life with people less likely to express unpopular views. A former CIA officer and whistleblower, Ray McGovern, believes it's because people feel cornered by government surveillance. Americans are afraid, uh, you know, when they hear all this, when they hear people calling Snowden a traitor, which he is not, when they, when they hear him called a, a spy, which he is not, well, they're sensitive enough to realize that if they find themselves talking about Edward Snowden and expressing not only support, perhaps just questionings, well, is he really a spy or is he really a traitor? Well, that will be picked up and could be used against them eventually. The reason government collects all this information 
is to use it. The only reason, the only way uh, to prevent this from being used against you is to prevent it from being collected in the first place. All right, after the break on RT International, we take you behind the scenes here at the network to show you how we cover the worldwide headlines. Famous politicians tweeting that a foreign government is using excessive force against protesting citizens. Does this mean we're going to see yet another intervention to democratize their government into the dirt like in Iraq or Libya? Wait, wait, ah, nothing is going to happen because that politician is Russian. But why is this so? Why can the police beat up or terrorize protesters in some countries, but in others, if you lift one finger, you are going to get a NATO lesson in human rights? Well, the answer is simple. This tweet and any attempts to intervene from Duma member Alexei Pushkov won't happen because unlike what they tell you in school, might does make right. For you youngins out there, old Grandpa Kirby remembers the Cold War and back when there were two great powers, they had to at least behave well to woo people into believing that one side were the good guys. Now that's all gone. The problem is the monopolar world that we live in. Heck, if the U.S. still had to deal with Soviet or some other propaganda, we would never see as much footage of flagrant police misconduct that we do now. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, and the geopolitical monopoly that we all live in really isn't good for the average person in or outside of America, especially if they want to protest. But that's just my opinion. The reason for Scotland becoming independent is Scotland's a nation that nations should be self-governing. They govern their own affairs better than allowing someone else to do it for them. speak your language? Want news, programs and documentaries in Arabic? It's all here on RT. Reporting from the world's hotspots, VIP interviews, intriguing stories. Are you here? Then try RT Arabic. To find out more, visit arabic.rt.com. Today, amid signs of moderate progress in okay. Syria, peace talks are on. Many, many more people turn out here. Moscow's Red Square. Demonstrators refuse to leave the barricade, saying it's whatever super. And you can see they're covering themselves with. We count the horrors they saw. 